now turning to the next DUI alumnus, uh, Felix, uh, who's going to talk about how banks are passing on compliance costs. How nicely. And good morning to everyone. Thanks for showing up. And thanks to Andreas and, uh, and Torsten for including our paper in this session. I have to admit, I, I was born and raised in Frankfurt, so the city has a special place in my heart, and it always makes me and my parents extra happy if my job takes me back here. Now, I, I, I'm not working for the Euro system, but my co-author, Melina, is. She's also uh, sitting here in the audience today, and um, that is why we have a standard disclaimer as well. These are our views, not those of the ECB or the Euro system. Now, let me start the presentation by stating something very obvious, is that not all elements of banking supervision get equal attention in academic circles in the media. On one end of the spectrum, you have things like capital requirements, risk weights, leverage ratios. And then, you know, more recently, for obvious reasons, there is renewed interest in liquidity regulation, LCRs, NSFR, and so on. And then far down the line towards the other end of the spectrum, there are rules on banks' large exposures. And that is what our paper is about about the unintended consequences of large exposure rules for banks in the euro area. Now, there are probably some, some experts in the room who know the details much better than we, than we do. But for now, what matters is that banks must report their clients if the exposure to those clients exceeds a bank-specific threshold, namely 10% of the bank's tier one capital. Now, there are many reasons to believe that reporting to the supervisor is costly for the banks. There are administrative costs, you know, interacting with the supervisor is costly, it, is, it binds resources, identifying the right counterparties uh, binds resources. But there are also more subtle, more indirect, you know, uh, um, potential costs. So for example, imagine that if a large amount of large exposures that you report raises red flags and invites more scrutiny in the future, for example, in the form of on-site inspections. Right? We've, we've heard that many times at this conference, that these on-site inspections, they, they matter. Then, you know, it is, it is uh, not hard to conclude that this reporting is costly, and we can derive some research questions from that. And those are the three questions that we ask in the paper and that I will uh, and, and answer and uh, that I will talk about today. First of all, do banks actively try to avoid crossing this reporting threshold? In other words, you know, in, in more technical terms, is there bunching below this threshold? Second, if they do cross the threshold, do they treat those exposures above the threshold differently than those below? For example, in the form of higher interest rates, you know, thinking about passing on the cost of, of reporting to the borrowers. And then third, if so, how do the borrowers react? If they, if, if they know they pay more for crossing the threshold with their bank, does it mean that they start looking for alternative funding sources? Okay. Now, a, a quick snapshot of the results. So obviously, I've used some buzzwords already, so you, know, you will uh, probably have imagined that this is a, 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 an application of the standard regression discontinuity framework. We're going to compare loan terms left and right of the threshold. And what we find is that, first of all, banks, and in particular the smallest banks, shift exposures from above to below the reporting threshold after a, um, a regulatory tightening of that threshold uh, a few years ago. Second, that's sort of the, the main result that we're selling the paper on, is that banks charge an interest rate premium, and a pretty steep one uh, at that, of you know, roughly 76 basis points on large exposures after this tightening of the threshold. The firms that end up paying this premium are, as you would expect, mostly the firms that have only few banking relationships. So those with fewer outside options, those that don't really have anywhere to go, in other words. Fourth, we can observe that when borrowers approach the reporting threshold with their existing banks, they become more likely to branch out and look for new banking relationships, start new banking relationships. All of this coincides with this last finding that in a statistical sense, and I, I will be more explicit about that later, we don't find any statistically significant bunching below the threshold. The distribution of exposures is smooth, in other words, around the threshold. So what that suggests, you know, combined with result number two, is there must be some really substantial frictions, as we all know, for example, in the form of switching costs. Because if there were no switching costs, 
firms could always choose to go to another bank where they fall below the threshold. All right, now, before I go into the details, let me, let me recap a few of the institutional details for, um, uh, because as I said, this is not as well known as some other parts of banking regulation. Let's start with the definition. A large exposure is an exposure to a counterparty that exceeds 10% of the bank's tier one capital. Now a few more clar clarifications. When I say exposure, I mean the combined accounting value of loans, bonds, stocks, and even derivative exposures. And even more precisely, it's not on the slide, but when I say loans, this includes off balance sheet commitments. So, you know, unused credit lines. They're all part of what an exposure is, uh, according to the law, to the CRR. Second, when I say counterparty, I don't just mean, you know, individual entity level uh, counterparties, but we're actually talking about groups of connected counterparties. So that means, among other things, you have to aggregate by group structures, you know, subsidiaries and parents have to be taken together, even things like important suppliers, important customers, important creditors uh, could, could matter here. And all of this is to say that, you know, identifying these counterparties is a big job for the banks. Now, specifically, what we're interested in this paper is not what, what some people might know is that, that there is a large exposure limit, uh, but what we really care about is just the reporting requirement. And to be precise, each bank must report, first of all, all its large exposures, so all the exposures to which this definition applies, but also on top of that, the 20 largest exposures, even if they do not meet the definition above. So what that means is it gives us some nice variation and some nice bank heterogeneity because the effective reporting threshold for banks will always be the minimum of these two quantities, either 10% of tier one capital, or if it's smaller, the size of the 20th largest exposure. And that gives us a, a way to split the sample into what we could call a treatment group and a control group of banks. The treatment group is those banks for which 10% is the effective threshold that's where we expect the discontinuity in the RDD uh, analysis to be. Whereas here, we don't expect anything to happen at 10% because the effective threshold is somewhere below that, okay? Now, you may ask if this is just a reporting requirement and there is no immediate you know, punishment or consequence for the bank, then why should all of this matter? How costly can that really be? And I'll now show you three quick pieces of evidence and, and hope to convince you that these costs do matter. The first thing you can do uh, is, you know, if you want to know how costly regulation is, you could just ask the reported entities, right, survey them. And that's what the EBA did in 2021. They uh, surveyed a sample of large, uh, or a sample of banks in the euro area about their supervisory reporting costs. And I show you here a selected result from that, which says that all the reporting requirements related to large exposures consistently rank you know, in or around the top 10 out of 60 different reporting requirements, especially so for the smaller banks, right? So large exposure reporting is considered by banks, self-reported, one of the most costly reporting requirements. Obviously, you know, these results will be biased. It's, it doesn't take long to, you know, to, to, to get to that idea. So, you know, rather than just looking at what the banks say, let's look at a market-based measure of, you know, whether these, these, uh, these um, requirements matter or not. And for that, we're now expo exploiting a policy shock. We're exploiting the, the amendment of the CRR in 2019, it was announced in 2019, that effectively lowered the threshold for reporting. And more precisely, when I say lowered, I mean, it is still 10%. It was 10%, it is 10% now, but the base was changed. Prior to the reform, the, re the threshold was 10% of el so-called eligible capital, which included parts of tier two capital. And then after the reform, it was reduced to only tier one. So what this means is that for a big fraction of banks, the threshold was reduced by quite a lot. What you see here down here is, the, is a histogram of banks uh, according to how strongly this, the threshold was reduced. You see that for almost half of banks, there was virtually no change. These are the banks that just didn't have any tier two capital. So, you know, no change in threshold. But for some of the banks, you know, more than half, the threshold was actually reduced by up to 25%. So this is pretty, um, pretty, 
considerable. Now we ask, sort of one of the very basic things, you know, even, even first year students in, in, in finance can do is a simple event study. You look at the stock price reactions of European banks around the announcement of that, uh, uh, of that amendment. And what you see on the left is just the uh, a histogram of the cumulative abnormal returns, so the aggregated excess returns over a market index over a three-day window around the announcement of the reform. And the average, I mean, the picture itself doesn't matter much, the average says that you know, uh, on average, there was a sort of 80 basis points negative abnormal return. This doesn't tell us much about our question yet. All it says is that you know, shareholders don't like it if, if regulators get tougher on banks. Duh. Um, but the right-hand side picture is much more informative for our question, because here we're now correlating this cumulative abnormal return for each bank with a measure of the exposure to that threshold reduction, which is the, the ratio of tier two to tier one capital. And even though you know it doesn't look super steep, uh, this is a, a highly significant negative relationship in the sense that you know, one standard deviation increase in this ratio, so these are the banks for which the threshold is more strongly reduced, translates into a third of a standard deviation uh, reduction in stock returns. So there is some evidence that the market does price in higher cost or lower future returns uh, for those banks that now have to, have to report more exposures. Finally, and this I think is the, the most convincing and most important, one of the most important plots of the presentation actually. This is now actually showing the distribution of exposures before and after the tightening. And I, can th I think you can see pretty beautifully that you know, the two lines, red and blue, red before the tightening, red afterwards, they mostly overlap around this threshold, but you can clearly see that some of the mass was shifted from above the threshold before to below the threshold after the reform. And this pattern is even more pronounced if we look at only the subset of the smallest banks, those with uh, total assets in the bottom quartile of the bank distribution. Right? So this is consistent with the idea that the reporting costs matter and they matter most for the smallest banks. So now I hope we've established that the reporting costs do matter, but we wanna go deeper. We wanna find out to what extent and how, how much do they matter. And for that, we need to go uh, you know, we need to increase the, the sophistication. There are many experts and many of the data sets we use have been used by others in the room. So I'll just mention a few buzzwords here. Our data set consists of three main sources. The main source, the most important one is Anna Credit. So the credit registry, loan level data. We crucially, we merge this with SHS on group level. So security holdings, you know, because I mentioned earlier that an exposure also includes security exposures, stocks and bonds in particular. And then finally, we get supervisory bank balance sheet data from, uh, you know, from, from SSM data sets, at least uh, as much as we can get within the, the data sharing arrangement between DGR and, and the SSM. So that means our sample includes all the significant institutions and also a large share uh, of the less significant institutions. At the end of the day, we end up with you know, more than 1,100 banks, uh, more than 107,000 borrowers. We only focus on the non-financial corporate sector, by the way, because there uh, we don't see derivative exposures. And in, in terms of exposures to the non-financial sector, derivatives hardly matter. So that's why we have this focus. And our sample period covers basically, you know, from the start of Anna Credit in, um, in 2018, all the way up to the end of last year. So I said, this is an RDD paper, very straightforward. So just to, to, um, to, to, to re refresh our minds, what we're basically doing is we're running a regression where the left-hand side variable, the dependent variable, is the interest rate on new loans between a bank and a firm. And on the right-hand side, we have the, what we call the exposure ratio. So total exposure divided by tier one capital. And we do that separately, left and right of the 10% threshold, and the RD estimate will be the difference between the two lines exactly at the threshold. Right? So it's the, the predicted jump in interest rates that a firm will have to pay if it is right above its bank's threshold compared to if it was at another bank where it is below the threshold. And these are results, and we, you know, the, the, the nice thing about our setup is that we can combine the regression discontinuity aspect of this setup 
with a diff and diff kind of setting because we have this reform where the threshold was tightened. So what you see here is you know, four columns. We have a before the reform and after the reform sample. And we always split into the treatment and control group of banks. Columns one and three are the control group where we don't expect anything to happen. And columns two and four are the ones where, you know, the, the, the reporting threshold suggests there could be a discontinuity here. And that is the main result we find. 76 basis points, pretty significant. And I'm not going to show you every single robustness check we did. You know, generally in the regression discontinuity literature, results can be pretty fragile and sensitive to parameters and, 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 and different technical choices. We checked a lot of them, bandwidth, weighting the observations close and, and, and far away from the thresholds differently. We uh, included fixed effects. We, we, we ran an interesting placebo test and nothing could really kill this effect. So um, that is the, the, the main finding, but you know, to understand the mechanism behind it and, the, and, and, and give some interpretation to these results, we now dig deeper and split the sample once more, namely into, uh, we split it by bank size, first of all, those are columns one to three, and then we split it by the number of bank relationships that firms have in columns four and, uh, and five. And what you see here is that the result is basically exclusively driven by the smallest banks. So again, these are the bottom quartile of the distribution. And by extension, what this also means is that, you know, because the, the threshold is bank dependent, these are also the smallest firms, you know, in the subset of large borrowers, right? We're not talking about mom and pop stores here. This is still SME uh, territory, but it is, you know, we're not talking about the, the big hitters with access to capital markets and so on, but these are really still bank dependent firms we're talking about. And this is corroborated by the evidence here in columns four and five. The firms that end up paying the premium are those with a number of banking relationships below the median, which is two in our sample, right? So again, the argument we make is these are the banks, these are the firms, sorry, that don't really have anywhere to go. Now, to wrap up in time, let me go straight here. What we do here, that's the final part of our analysis, is that we, we aggregate things up to the firm level and we ask, what do, how do firms respond if they approach the reporting threshold with their existing bank? And the way we do this is we, we run a, a simple linear regression, linear probability model. The dependent variable is a dummy that indicates whether a bank started a new banking relationship in a given quarter that didn't exist before. And we regress that on a simple measure of distance to the threshold in the previous quarter, right? distance to the 10% threshold. And we find a you know, highly significant and negative relationship here, which means the closer you get to the threshold, the more likely you are to add new banking relationships in the next quarter, especially if you have few banks to begin with. That's what the interaction effect down here means. And uh, again, this is, a, this is a quantitatively significant effect. We have this little sort of, uh, back of the envelope calculation down here, a numerical example for a firm with initially two banks, a one standard deviation reduction in the lagged distance, so you know, getting closer to the threshold, increases the probability to add a new bank by 1.5 percentage points. And the unconditional mean here is 6.4, so this is pretty large. Now, I'm not a, a big fan of, of repeating myself on the last slide. I, I hope I made myself sufficiently clear uh, during the presentation about what our results are. Let me instead end with something that is not on the slides, uh, just because it fits the, the previous content of the conference pretty well. We recently did something that a lot of people here in the, in the room did in their papers, which is to uh, analyze significant and less significant institutions differently. And we're not confident enough yet to put the result into the slides, but it, our, our you know, preliminary evidence suggests that the significant institutions, those directly supervised by the ECB, they do bunch in a statistically significant sense. So there is sort of excess mass of exposures below the threshold. And if, if we can corroborate, corroborate that evidence in the coming weeks, that would of course be another nice uh, addition to that paper saying that banks are more afraid of interacting with uh, the ECB than they are with their national supervisors. And with that, I, I conclude and I'm looking forward to Emilia's discussion of our paper. Thank you very much.
and already introduced, Emilia will be discussing. Thank you. So thank you very much to the organizers, um, Glenn, for inviting me to discuss this super interesting paper. Um, just before I start, I want to make the usual disclosure that these are my views and they don't necessarily coincide with the Norges Bank. So, um, okay, so let me just summarize very, very briefly this paper. Um, the main question is whether banks pass on the compliance costs to their borrowers and they have a very, very nice setting, um, this uh, a change in regulation that increases the reporting requirements for uh, the large exposures of banks. Okay, this is the so-called the LEX regulation. Okay, so what is this uh, change in, in regulation? What's, it's a capital requirement regulation that basically reduced the threshold okay? for some banks. Which banks? Those banks that, ha that have positive amounts of tier two capital, okay? And then as Felix very clearly explained in his presentation, they use a, a regression discontinuity uh, design to compare interest rates on the, on, on the loans with exposures just below and just above this, the, the disclosure threshold. Now there are many findings in the paper. I'm gonna focus on the main ones. Uh, which is that after the reform, small banks do shift the exposures below the, the reporting threshold, suggesting high costs of the, this regulation. And corroborating this, um, they find that uh, large exposure borrowers uh, have a, a significant increase in their, in their borrowing costs, okay, a six, 76 in, uh, basis point increase. And the interpretation, as is well summarized on the title of the paper, um, is that banks pass the compliance cost to the borrowers. Now, I have, so th this is a super, super interesting uh, paper. It's a great research question, a very important topic. It goes back to, you know, the core, pr core principles for effective banking supervision. So here is just a quote from the Basel Committee says that local laws and bank regulations should set prudent limits on large exposures to a single borrower. Um, it is an important topic. So large exposures are important. There's a related paper with some of my colleagues in Norges Bank that shows that actually a concentration of single name counterpart, counterparty risk can have significant real effects. So I think this paper talks to that literature. This, in, in particular, this, this paper looks about an unintended consequence of the regulation, right? Um, so it is closest to uh, one paper that looks at uh, how these large exposure regulations can increase systemic risk. And of course, the contribution here is on the, the, the real effect, right? This, um, uh, increase in borrowing costs uh, to to the to the to the firms. Okay, so it contributes. Now I have uh, three or four main comments to about this paper. Um, so my very first one is about the motivation. Okay, so the question here is, what are these compliance costs, and why is it really so costly? Okay, now. The, the authors make a very, very clear stance in the introduction that they want to be agnostic about these compliance costs are. And I'm going to argue here that it actually does matter where these compliance costs um, come from, because that, that, you know, that, that tells us to which literature should the paper speak to, okay? So, in their discussion, in the motivation, they identify three reasons. Although they are agnostic, they say, okay, this can come because banks need to identify the connected counterparties, and this is costly, okay? And this increases the operating expenses. So these, these points relate to operational costs, okay? Uh, but they also mention that there might be fear uh, of reporting the largest, uh, uh, there is a typo here, the largest firms the largest exposures due to more uh, scrutiny in the future, okay? Now, they are using a change in the regulation, okay? 
to 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 find the what uh, this compliance cost. Now, what changes before and after the the regulation? So. In my mind, but maybe you, you have a different idea, and in that case, I think that this should be discussed in the paper, but in my mind, before the regulation, these operational costs were already there, because irrespective of what is the capital base that has to be used before or after the regulation, banks already had to keep track of the largest exposure, so they had to identify already what are the groups of connected counterparties and so on. What only changes is which exposures will be actually um, reported as a, a um, new exposure to, to the regulator. So in my mind, the, um, the, the fear of reporting largest exposures is important and is most likely what is driving this. Okay? So this brings me to the interpretation of the results. Okay? So when the Basel Committee was discussing about th this regulation, uh, here is a quote from uh, what this uh, regulation was to be addressing. And one thing that stands out is that, uh, so in, in this regulation, it's, there's two parts. There's a, that there's a binding limit, and then there's a disclosure limit. Okay? Now, the binding limit, you banks can use credit risk mitigation techniques to adjust, okay? But in the disclosure limit, there is not such um, credit risk mitigation, okay? So you just report the largest exposures without taking into account potential uh, guarantees or credit risk mit mitigation. And the idea was to, like, harmonize the reporting across jurisdiction and so on. And so, with this idea, the, the euro area modified the regulation to not allow any more uh, for, to use tier two capital as eligible capital, and this might have led to more disclosures, okay? So in my mind, an alternative interpretation is that through this reduction in, in, in the eligible capital, um, there was a new flagging of risks um, that might discipline the financial institutions because they're sort of raising awareness that there are these new risks that were not previously flagged to the institutions. So in my mind, this paper may speak a little bit more closer to the literature on supervisory scrutiny. So there is this paper by Koch and co-authors, and yesterday also Cedric presented a paper together with Hans uh, on this uh, supervisor's re-scrutiny. So I think, so it m must be more clearly um, defined why you think that it, this is really compliance costs or operational costs or, or, or not, okay? Now, I have some ideas here for the authors to disentangle across the interpretations. Um, so maybe you want to do like a, a, a dynamic setting because if it's operational costs, then you should observe an increase in the operation costs only just after, but not after, so not, not on the long term, right? On the contrary, if it's supervisory scrutiny, you should find that all new exposures should carry this interest rate premium going forward, okay? Um, and another implication about disentangling across these interpretations is that um, in, if it's compliance cost, then interest rates should be increased homogeneously for all new exposures. But if it's supervisory scrutiny, then arguably the cost should increase more for firms with larger exposures. Now, you find a negative slope in your main, in your main results, which would suggest that this is more like an operational type of cost. But, um, if you look carefully at the graph, this is really driven by the exposures that are very close to the threshold, which leads me to my next comment, which is about measurement, okay? So throughout the paper, one assumption is that the researchers can observe a close enough signal uh, to whatever the banks are observing as a large exposure, 
But there are some possible sources of errors. Some of them are discussed in the paper and Felix discussed them, so off balance sheet exposures. Another uh, possible source of error, differences between what the bank actually discloses and what the researchers observe is the exposures of subsidiaries outside of the EU. But there are other types of possible sources of error, okay? So how do you aggregate to the group level? So for example, if there are indirect holdings, how do you aggregate those? I, I think a little bit more of disclosure could be in order, or what type of accounting rules um, matter? Are you using book or market values? What is the... Um, the foreign exchange rate that you're use, using and so on, the valuation date. And these small things may matter. So I'm in Norges Bank, and Norges Bank has the investment uh, management. And a small error and in their Excel file, so a valuation date cost the fund $92 million very recently. So these things matter. And they matter also, I argue, in, in the context of this paper because of your RDD setting, right? So where you are measuring the exposure matters on where you're classifying this exposure, whether it's below or above the threshold. And this could lead to, type, to, to errors, and most likely you are going to report some, of, some large exposures that actually are large exposures below the threshold, which might lead to an upward bias in, in the estimates. Okay? And so my suggestion, and I end... Uh, in a second is maybe it's useful to validate your LEX measure. So you have some information about the actual disclosures of the bank. So you have some firms with the common codes. So maybe you want to show the difference in the exposure ratios between, between those and correlate those with the, the characteristics that you are observing in the data. Another way could be to you know, calculate text similarity of calculated exposures um, with, the, with the names that are actually disclosed by the regulator and see how, those, how similar those are. Or calculate the number of new disclosures by the bank and correlate with new disclosures. But I think it, it is important that you validate that you are actually measuring something very, very, very close to whatever the bank um, is, is disclosing. So I have some other comments, but just to conclude, it's very, very interesting. Um, and yeah, I have said everything else. <laughs> Looking forward to the next uh, version of the paper. Thank you very much, Amelia, for these very comprehensive comments. Um, questions from the floor, yes. Klaus, wait for the mic, please. Yeah, yes, quickly. So I agree with Emilia that, uh, I mean, banks need to track uh, connected counterparties anyway, independently on the threshold. So this is something you should think about. And the second one is why unintended consequences of uh, compliance or scrutiny? So it is very much intent to limit the concentration risk. So in the end, the effect is bank, either because borrowers do want to stay there or whichever is the reason, concentration risk has to reduce, so probably this is very much intended from the supervisor viewpoint. Okay. Yeah, thank you for this very interesting paper. Um, my first question is uh, very similar to yours, I, if I understood correctly. Uh, I would argue that the main compliance costs are really with the monitoring, and that means there may be even more borrowers below the threshold than above which creates the costs. So charging only those above may look a little bit unfair and um, may not be the case. In my first, my first, first question. The second is on um, risk concentrations. Uh, I would argue that um, uh, if you have more large exposures, you have also larger risk concentrations and banks might want to charge the clients for this. Now you can argue this is in a theoretical model continuous, so why the threshold? But it happened before that banks take a supervisory threshold for using it for internal risk management purposes. And then suddenly, coincidentally, because they think supervisors are wise, also apply it internally. So I would control maybe in your regressions with some concentration risk measures in order to, to check if this also contributes 
uh, somehow. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we have two last questions over there. First, well, three, okay. First, the gentleman in the purple shirt. There is another one here. Oh, sorry, then we have to go back there. Sorry to make you run so much. Hi, quick question or suggestion on, on the topic. Um, if my memory serves, correct, serves me correctly, in large exposure data, you only supported or required to report a limited number of cases, no? But uh, there are some banks that report way more than that. So this would be maybe an example where you can have a full co collection of all the group of connected clients issues and would be able to observe if there's actually a threshold effect, no? Because if these also show this effect, then there is a threshold effect, at least for these specific subset. Um, another point is on, on the estimate. No? The 75 basis points that you have, I would say, is rather large in, in terms of magnitude. No? If you talk about large exposures, there are huge exposure. If a firm comes to the same bank again, asks for a new loan, um, 75 basis points is, I don't know, very high in, in, in my view. Thanks. Thank you. The gentleman behind you with the mask. Um, my comment is actually very related to this last point. I, I wonder if you could give us a back of the envelope of how much this would be amount to. And 76 basis points seems like a lot. It would even be, be perhaps a lower bound because you also wouldn't necessarily expect uh, all the compliance costs to be passed through. So, uh, And then also to compare with perhaps other economic magnitudes of uh, regulation, like people have done estimates with bunching on the, around the 50 billion threshold in the US for banks in which they have to implement dot frank, etc. So it would be a, ra a rather interesting sort of uh, analysis to make, I think. Thank you very much. And then on the other side, this gentleman, and then there was. Thank you. Uh, coming from Austria, a market uh, with a lot of LSIs, I would be interested whether you can differentiate between uh, small LSIs, say private banks, and then cooperative banks uh, on the other hand, because my assumption would be that the effect you show is uh, stronger with private banks rather than uh, with cooperatives. But yeah, it would be an interesting question. Thanks. Okay, and then finally, last but not least, the lady over there. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, the two. Oh, my goodness. Okay, well, then let's start with gentlemen and go to the lady. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, quickly coming back to the supervisory scrutiny mechanism, like now you're exploiting like heterogeneity in banks, but could you look at the firm characteristics and see whether it's maybe the zombies or the less creditworthy ones that are shifting below the, the reporting threshold, let's say, because that would be more in line with like a monitoring um, concern, I would think. Okay, but now finally, the lady, thanks. Thank you. Very interesting work. Uh, I was wondering whether you can control for the presence of COVID-19 guarantees that uh, um, might, of course, uh, impact uh, the, the results that you showed before. Thank you. And I have three comments. Uh, first, and I think this goes a little bit what uh, somebody over there said. I mean, you they have to report the top 20 independent whether or not they are close to the threshold. I mean, maybe you've done this, but could you do actually kind of a placebo test? top uh, exposures um, that maybe you've done this, but that uh, are not close to, the, um, uh, to the, the limit, but have to be reported. And then the other two comments I have kind of refers to the corporate financing uh, repercussions. Um, I mean, to which extent do borrowers that hit that limit actually look for new relationships? And you observed it in the data. And shouldn't there be also an uptick in uh, syndicated lending? So, good, so now, uh, Felix, you are in a very uncomfortable position because you are standing between uh, the people here and the coffee break. So um, uh, in your interest, make it sure. I, I need to be a bit selective. So if, if your question is not among the ones that I'll answer now, please uh, hit me up during the coffee break later. Uh, I want to start with the ones that I can answer more most easily, of course. Um, and one that I, I was wait, basically waiting for the question is Joao's question on you know back of the envelope calculation for how important quantitatively are those costs. We do that in the paper because we have information on exposure sizes and the interest rate, so we can basically calculate for each firm, for the average firm, what's the average additional euro cost that they pay each year. And this is pretty much in the ballpark of, of the self-reported reporting costs that the banks report to the EBA. So just to give you a number, for, for small banks, I think the, the average cost of reporting a large exposure would be around 13,000 euros, whereas the reported total large exposure cost they, they report to the EBA is 300K. So it's in a ballpark where we can say, you know, we're, we're not completely measuring something wildly different. But of course, this is just a rough calculation. 
Uh, then something, well, COVID-19 guarantees, I thought about credit guarantees as well, but the thing with, with, the, with these guarantees is they might affect interest rates across the board, but why would there be a discontinuity around the threshold? Right? That's, that's the advantage of, of the RDD threshold, that any confounding story would have to be related to the discontinuity, and I, I don't see how that would be the case with, with the COVID guarantees. Uh, then, Cédric, for you, the, the short and unfortunate answer is we observe very little detail on the firm side because all our data comes more from the banking side. All we observe for firms is basically a, a noisy measure of size, but mostly how many banks do they borrow from because of Anna Credit. Right? So, unfortunately, on the firm side, it's not very, um, very rich. We do observe ratings, credit ratings, and we throw in ratings fixed effects and the results only become stronger. Um, speaking of fixed effects, um, um, I think uh, the gentleman here on the left asked about adding a measure of concentration risk because maybe it is really self interest I mean, a, a rational response to credit concentration risk. We don't have measures of concentration risk yet, but we do, again, have bank fixed effects. So to the extent that this is a bank level measure, it, it could be... Um, could be absorbed already. Maybe one or two more comments. One or two more, okay. Let me, what are the most important ones? Um, well, thanks to Emilia. Anyway, there, there were lots of very good questions in there. Um, we do observe off-balance sheet loan exposures. They are recorded in, um, in Anna Credit. But one thing we cannot observe, I'll have to, to be very frank about that, is supplier or, or customer relationships. So it is true that all the, observe, all the exposures we classify as large are large but we make the type two area the error that some of the exposures on the left might actually be somewhere on the right or even far to the right outside of our sample. But the way we thought about it is that this actually biases the result against us, not, um, not, in, not in our favor. Because you know, if some of our non-large exposures are actually large and still we observe the jump, it would probably be even larger if we had correctly classified them. Do I have more or? Uh, no. No. All right. All right. Sorry for well, that. Thank you very uh, much, Felix.